how do you undervolt and overclock a Radeon RX 9070 XT? In this video, we are going to find out. My name is Matt, I'm a former rocket scientist, and my goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. In the It's Not Rocket Science series, we've been helping you troubleshoot and optimize your system to keep your PC running like a pro. It's Not Rocket Science, and as you'll see throughout this series, it really is Lego. A question I see a lot of AMD enthusiasts and gamers ask is, how do I undervolt and overclock my GPU? I'm sure that many of you have heard about the amazing benefits of undervolting Ryzen CPUs. But what you might not be aware of is that Radeon GPUs can be undervolted too, significantly improving performance and temps. For AMD GPUs like the 9070 XT and 7900 XTX, it's easy to do this in adrenaline, but if you push the undervolt too far, you can run into problems. But don't worry, in this video, I'll provide you with a step-by-step -step guide on how to undervolt and overclock your GPU the right way, allowing you to lower your temps and increase performance without impacting stability. The test system that I'm using for this video is my AMD AM5 open bench table with the following components. For the CPU, we have an AMD Ryzen 7 9800X3D. For the motherboard, we have an ASUS ROG Crosshair X870E Hero. For RAM, we have G-Skill Ripjaws M5 Neo RGB 32GB of DDR5 6000 at CL26. For the GPU, we have a Sapphire Nitro Plus AMD Radeon RX 9070XD. For the CPU cooler, we have an ASUS ROG Ryo 3 360mm AIO. For storage, we have a 4TB Samsung 990 Pro NVMe Gen 4 M.2 SSD. And for the PSU, we have a Corsair HX 1200i Platinum 1200W power supply. Affiliate links for all of these components are listed in the description below. You can overclock an AMD Radeon GPU different ways and with different tools. The process that I'll walk you through in this video is a robust approach that I've developed and modified over a long period of time to not only ensure that you achieve a max overclock clock, but more importantly, that you achieve stable performance. Given that software control of overvoltage has been significantly limited in modern GPUs, there's really no way to damage your card using this approach, so it's something I would at least encourage you to try. One important point to understand before attempting to overclock your GPU is that your results will vary based on the quality of your silicon. Some people will get lucky and get a golden sample chip that can overclock extremely well, and some will get unlucky and see very minor results from overclocking. This is called the silicon lottery because the silicon quality you get when buying a CPU or GPU is effectively a roll of the dice. That said, you'll never know unless you give it a shot. Step one, GPU tuning software. You'll first need software to adjust the power, voltage, boost clock, and memory clock, the primary parameters that need to be adjusted to undervolt and overclock your GPU. For AMD GPUs, there really isn't any need to use third-party software because the Adrenaline Edition software offers full manual tuning control. The controls are located under performance and tuning. If you look under GPU, you have a tuning control area where you have a lot of different presets that you can try. But the one that we're interested in is under tuning presets where you can select custom to give you full control. Step two, establish a baseline. Before tuning any component, you should benchmark it at default power, voltage, and clock settings to establish a baseline. Since this is a GPU, I use 3D Mark Speedway, Port Royal, and Steel Nomad as my primary benchmarking tools. Once you've established a baseline and recorded your benchmark scores, then you can proceed to the next step. step Step three, adjust power and voltage. Now for the fun part. This is a trial and error process. It's simple, but you need to be patient and build up to a maximum undervolt in small steps. The first thing you should do is enable power tuning and move the power limit slider to the max. For my 9070 XT, the max I can increase the slider is 10%. Hit apply changes and then rerun one of your benchmarks to see what impact the increased power has on performance. I typically use Steel Nomad as my primary GPU benchmarking tool because I've found that it tests the GPU much more thoroughly than other benchmarks. For the purpose of this tutorial, I left fan tuning disabled. If your temperatures get too high, then this is something you can adjust to improve cooling. The next parameter you should adjust for a Radeon GPU is the voltage offset. To do this, you need to first enable GPU tuning. You will now have two sliders, one for max frequency offset and the other for voltage offset. Leave the max frequency offset at zero for now while we establish a stable undervolt. I typically start by decreasing the voltage offset in increments of 15 millivolts, rerunning the benchmark and recording my score. Make sure to hit apply changes after each voltage offset adjustment. If I get to about negative 80 millivolts without any issues, then I typically switch to smaller increments of 10 millivolts. The objective is to find the undervolt where the benchmark hangs or returns an error, which should correlate to max performance. If you get an error, then go back to the last stable offset and reduce it in smaller increments of say five millivolts. This will allow you to fine tune your undervolt. 
Once the benchmark returns another error or hangs, then back off to your last stable offset and hit apply changes. Congratulations, you've now found your stable GPU undervolt. Step four, adjust GPU boost and memory clocks. With your undervolt applied, you can now proceed to overclock your GPU. The approach is identical to the trial and error process used to find your undervolt. I typically adjust the GPU boost clock max frequency first, but whatever you do, don't change both clocks at the same time. You can adjust the GPU clock in adrenaline by increasing the max frequency offset slider under GPU tuning. I usually start aggressively by increasing this in increments of around 50 megahertz. The objective is to find a stability limit, the point at which your benchmark hangs or returns an error. If it does, then back off to your last stable overclock and try increasing it in smaller increments, say plus 10 megahertz, until you get another error. At this point, back off to your last stable overclock, hit apply changes, and this is your max GPU frequency offset. Unfortunately for my Sapphire Nitro Plus Radeon RX 9070 XT, changing the max frequency offset had absolutely no impact on performance. This is very strange behavior and may indicate some type of issue with the driver, so I decided to leave it at zero. That said, the default GPU clocks for this card are significantly higher than the reference RX 9070 XT specs, so this might be part of the reason why increasing GPU clocks had no impact. With a max frequency offset applied, I then focus on finding a max memory overclock. You can adjust the memory overclock in Adrenaline by enabling VRAM tuning and increasing the max frequency slider. I typically start by increasing the slider by increments of around 50 megahertz. Again, your objective is to find a stable performance peak. When your benchmark returns an error or your score starts to decrease, back off to your last overclock and try increasing it in smaller increments, say plus 10 megahertz. When you're looking at data like this, it can be really helpful to plot the data visually so it becomes clear when you find a peak in performance. Once you do find a peak, or a hit a stability limit, dial it in, hit apply changes, and this is your max GPU VRAM frequency. For my Sapphire Nitro Plus RX 9070 XT, I found an increase of approximately 160 megahertz was a limit to maintain stability and steel nomad. What's interesting is that I could push it a lot higher in Speedway and Port Royal, but steel nomad would always return an error, which is why I prefer using it to find a stable overclock. At this point, I run my other 3D Mark GPU benchmarks and test around the overclock in small increments just to make sure I'm extracting everything I can and that I didn't go too far. Sometimes by backing off a little on your overclock, you can achieve a higher score. When that happens, it means you pushed a little too far and are on the edge of stability. Step five, check stability. Congratulations, you've successfully extracted more free performance from your GPU. This final step is all about making sure that your overclock is stable. But what does stable actually mean? This can vary based on your needs. Some people think successfully booting into Windows is stable enough, but to me, stable means that your GPU will function without any issues, regardless of what programs you run. So the final test that I implement to ensure stability is to run Furmark for around 60 minutes. You can watch the GPU temp in real time and see if your system freezes at any point during the test. If it passes and your temperatures are reasonable, then your GPU overclock should be stable. That said, there is no guarantee that over time an overclock that was stable doesn't become unstable. But if that ever happens, you can simply go back to your default settings and follow this process again. Something I typically do once I discover my stable overclock is to purposely back off a little to ensure that I stay away from the stability edge. That will give you some room for thermal paste deterioration and help you avoid having to go through this process again in the future. You can even rerun some of the benchmarks to see just how much backing off a little reduces your performance. More than likely, it will not be meaningful. A bonus tip and something I always do after overclocking is to open a command prompt by typing CMD in search, right clicking on it and selecting run as administrator and running the SFC slash scan now command. This should find and repair corrupt files on your PC that may have been generated during the overclocking process. Once you've established a stable overclock, you can rerun your benchmarks to see just how much of an impact the overclock has on performance. For my Sapphire Nitro Plus Radeon RX 9070 XT, I decided to also run the automatic overclock option in Adrenaline. You can find the overclock GPU feature under automatic tuning. It only takes a few seconds to run, and for my 9070 XT, it increased the GPU frequency by 103 megahertz. Keep in mind that the Sapphire Nitro Plus has significantly higher core and boost clocks when compared against the AMD spec for the 9070 XT. So this boost is on top of that. As you can see from the results, the performance impact when using the automatic overclock option is minimal with a roughly 1% increase in scores. This should not come as a surprise given that the card was somewhat insensitive to changes in GPU frequency offset. This minor increase in performance also comes with a 10 to 30 watt increase in power. So it's definitely not something I would recommend. However, when you look at the 
the max overclock, there was a meaningful increase in performance of around 7%, which is good. You will see a relatively large increase in power, but the temperatures do not increase significantly, which is likely due to the large undervolt. Your results will vary based on silicon quality and cooling solution, but based on these results, it's worth spending some time to find a stable overclock. Whenever I overclock a GPU, I use 3D Max Steel Nomad as my primary surrogate for games. I do this because there's less variability with a synthetic benchmark, it's consistent and repeatable, and it uses a similar graphics engine as modern games, so it tests the GPU in very similar ways. Even though it's effectively a non-playable game, I always get a few people in the comments who claim that the performance increases in 3D Mark do not reflect real-world gaming, and that the performance in games will be less. To see if that's true, I tested five popular games and I compared the performance at default settings with the auto and max overclocks. As you can see from Total War Warhammer 3, the performance increases almost identical to the 3D Mark results, with average increases of 1.6% for the auto overclock and 6.9% for the max overclock. In fact, when you look at all of the games that I tested, you see very similar trends, with average increases of 0.8% and 6.9% in Cyberpunk 2077, 1.4% and 7.7% in Microsoft Flight Simulator, and 0.2% and 5.4% in Monster Hunter Wilds. The only game that I tested that didn't match this trend was Call of Duty Black Ops 6, and only for the auto overclock, which showed a 2.3% decrease. The max overclock, however, was on trend with a 6.6% increase. So the notion that 3D Mark GPU benchmarks cannot be used as surrogates for games is simply not true. These benchmarks are non-playable games that are designed and developed to test your GPU in exactly the same way that modern games do. Given that the RX 9070 XT is the top card for AMD this generation, a few questions that keep coming up are can it compete with an RTX 5080 and is it better than an RX 7900 XTX? Now that we've found a max overclock for the RX 9070 XT, let's run a few games and see if we can answer these questions. If we look at Total War Warhammer 3 and compare our overclock 9070 XT to the 7900 XTX and 5080 in stock conditions, you see that it beats the 7900 XTE by around 2%, but loses to the 5080 by around 7%. If we now look at Cyberpunk 2077, a game that uses ray tracing, you can see that the 9070 XT destroys the 7900 XTX by around 30% and gets within 10% of the 5080, which is extremely impressive, especially when you consider that it beats the 5080 by around 20% and 1% low. This is a title that heavily favors NVIDIA GPUs, so this gen-to-gen -gen improvement in performance by AMD is exceptional. And finally, if we now turn our attention to Call of Duty Black Ops 3, a game that has traditionally favored AMD GPUs, you can see that the 9070 XT beats the 5080 by a whopping 35% in 1% lows and matches the 7900 XTX in average performance while also beating it in 1% lows. I also noticed that the shaders load significantly faster, which can be somewhat annoying on Nvidia GPUs. This is a very impressive showing from a card that costs anywhere from 20 to 50% less. But what happens if we also overclock the 7900 XDX and RTX 5080? Looking at the 3D Mark GPU benchmarks, you can see that an overclocked 9070 XT does indeed beat an overclocked 7900 XDX, but the RTX 5080 is able to extend its lead due to the excellent overclocking performance of this card. So to answer the questions, based on these results, the 9070 XT is a better gaming card compared to the 7900 XTX, but it can't quite match the performance of an RTX 5080. That said, if you're a serious Call of Duty fan and you currently use a 7900 XTX, I would definitely consider upgrading to a 9070 XT, but only if you can sell your 7900 XTX to cover most of the upgrade costs. Remember, it's not rocket science, it's Lego. My goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. Thank you for watching watching this video in the It's Not Rocket Science how-to series. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. And if you'd like to support the channel further and gain access to some really great perks, please also consider joining our membership program. Bye for now.